evening and welcome to Beulah Apostolic Health and Family Mondays 2023. It is Monday the 2nd of October and it's now gone 10 minutes past 7 in the evening. I now hand you over to our moderator for this evening in the person of Sister Lisita Osborne. God bless you, Sister Lisita. God bless you, everyone. It's lovely to have you all online. Um, also, our speaker, Anake Lo. Lovely to have you, Anake. Um, I'll talk more about Anake later. At this time, we'll start um, or by having our opening prayer, and we'll ask um, Sister Jean to do this prayer for us. Hallelujah. Father, we just want to bless your name at this time. We thank you, oh, Father God, for your goodness and your mercies, your kindness and your love towards us. We thank you, Lord, oh, Father God, that you care about the whole man, oh, Lord God, not just the spirit man, but the, ent the entire man. So I thank you, Father God, that you have allowed, oh, Father God, someone to organize so that we can learn more about health, Lord, oh, Father, so that we can take care of the temple that you are choose to dwell in. So, Father God, I pray right now that you will help us, Lord, that we will be able to, oh God, absorb the things that we have been taught. I pray for the speaker, Father God, that you will give them utterance even in this, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that they've availed themselves, Lord God, to be used to, Lord God, edify the body, oh God, because if we are not right in our bodies, then, Father God, it's very difficult, Lord God, for us to function in the spirit. So I thank you for the speaker that you have given lord god the graciousness lord oh father god to avail themselves to be able to help your people father god to live better lives oh god physically mentally and spiritually bless us now in jesus name amen amen thank you jesus um at this time i will ask our local women's president um sister law to come on and do a welcome for us. Unmute, Sister Lo. Sorry, sorry, bad thought. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we are. Yes, okay. Greetings to everyone in Jesus' name. Um, we are grateful to have this evening and I extend a warm welcome and greetings to everyone who are online this evening. I just want to greet my presiding bishop, Bishop Keith, if he's on, and to my pastor, Pastor Dunkley, who have afforded us this opportunity to be online and to have this, this, this Family Health Month, Mondays. I just want to say um, we're really happy, and I can tell that people are happy by we having it because by the amount of people who have logged on already. Um, greeting to our comms group who help us to sort us out this evening. I trust that everyone will have an enjoyable time. And for this month, we just want to have this going that people and we all can see the different things that we can do, the different things that can help us, not only spiritually, but physically. We are grateful that we, we have this opportunity that we can, we as a women's group from Wilson, Beulah Wilson, that we can put this on, not, not by me alone, but by the core group members who have worked hard and um, enable us to do this. I know that the speakers will be coming on, I will not mention, because she will be welcome in a, in a very good way by the moderator. But um, I know that all the presenters who are coming on for this month, I know they're very well knowledge and able in their, um, in, in, in their work and the job that they do. I just want to say a big welcome to all, whether you're on Zoom from Canada, America, or, or in the UK. I just want to welcome you, welcome you, welcome you, and trust that you have a fantastic time. God bless you in Jesus' name. Over to you, Sister Les. Thank you, Sister Lo. Um, I won't take up any time, but um, just in support of our presenter, our speaker tonight, if we could show our faces to so just cheer her on <laughs> and support her. Um, if you could turn your cameras on, if you can, that would be grateful. Thank you. Um, we uh, have with us... Sorry, Sister Les. Um, I will apologize for my camera maybe not being on because I am having problems 
with my device, like um, it, it's getting bad. So sorry. That's all right. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Um, so I go straight into our presenter. Um, no stranger to us. She's the daughter of um our very own sister Lo, and our late pastor Lo, and the sister also of Minister Junior, Lo. Um, Anake, that's Mrs. Anake, Sister Anake Lo Stiles. Uh, just read a brief profile about Anake. Anake is a child of God who loves to help people on their healing journey. She was born and raised in Manchester, Jamaica, and brought up in the Shiloh Apostolic Organization. She got married in December 2014 to her amazing husband and now attends Grace Apostolic Church, Red Bank, Manchester, where she has been involved in Sunday school and youth ministries. Anna Kay graduated from the University of the West Indies, Mona, in 2011 with a BSc in physical therapy and currently licensed with the Council for Professions Supplementary to Medicine, Jamaica, and the Health and Care Profession Council, UK. She has spent 10 years, she has spent over 10 years working in the public sector in Jamaica, gaining experience in inpatient and outpatient settings. She's a trained pelvic floor physical therapist and a member of the Jamaican Physiotherapy Association and the American Physical Therapy Association Pelvic Health. Anna Kay has received certification and training in techniques and treating the fertility patients, wound care, kines kinesio taping and currently training and currently training in pre and postpartum um, corrective exercise program. She's the owner of the Total Care Wellness and Rehab Solution Limited, performing physiotherapy services, specializing in pelvic floor and sales of physiotherapy and orthopedic supplies. I won't take any further time. I'll now hand over to our presenter, Anna K. Lowe Stulls. Thank you, Sister Les. <laughs> All right, greetings, everyone. I just want to ensure that everyone is here and me so you can just give me that check, thumbs up, anything like that, that I'm clear. All right, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, praise the Lord, everyone. I am at work. <laughs> um, so but thanks for having me. I, it has been an absolute pleasure just to accept this, you know, task. <laughs> You know, you know, well, you know, it's missionary law and she's very determined. So I had no option but to accept the task, right? <laughs> All right. So I would like to first, before I move on, you know, um, greet Bishop Keith Linton, Pastor Dunkley, and of course, my beautiful mother and my brother and sister-in-law and quite practically everybody because, you know, Beulah is my home, home away from home whenever I'm not in Jamaica. So for me, that is you know, extremely wonderful. So I'm grateful to be here and just to share my knowledge, you know, of what I know, because I'm literally on a path to educate persons as much as possible. So thanks for having me again. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead now and share my screen so that we can start the presentation. If there are any issues, you can always let me know before, even while I'm going on, all right? So let me share my screen. All right, so everybody's seen, it's fine so far. And at this point, I probably somebody would have to talk because I don't think I can even see myself anymore. I don't know where those things were. Yes, you're good. You're good. All right, wonderful. All and right, and so okay, and okay, before you go on, I'll just say um to everyone, if you need to do and if you have any questions, we won't ask the questions in between. We'll just um do the questions after. And the com the comms team will take the questions. So you see on their on their um title on their device, comms send your questions. So direct your questions to come send your questions to any one of those individuals, and we'll take your questions after Sister Anna Kay's presentation, please. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. All righty. So um, you know, I like this title. I say something's wrong with my what because. Persons will describe my what and never ever describe their body parts in words. And of course, I am here for it so that persons can, you know, no matter what age we are, we know that our body parts, even private as they may seem, are just private, are just body parts. <laughs> and we need to acknowledge and, you know, know what is wrong, what is going on so that we can actually live. It's not just about 
being healthy in parts that you, you can see, but also in parts that you cannot see, right? All right, so um, we're going to begin now. So we're going to talk about pelvic floor physical therapy. So a lot of you may or may not um, know what physical therapy is. You know, of course, it's just a trying to regain movement in any form in just a rehabilitation process. Now, pelvic floor is just a specialty within that. And we do focus on the rehabilitation of muscles in the pelvic floor region. And as you can see right here on the screen, um, there, that's our pelvic floor muscles. And especially um, after injury or any form of dysfunction, right? So, I like for persons to know what you're, you're what you are talking about. So this is what the female um, body looks like. So if you were to if you were to stand to the side and look at the body sideways, then this is what we look like, right? So here we have the rectum, which is of course this brown um, part of the picture here, and the vagina is here. Oh, I like to point out, and I'll always point out. It's a common thing for us to say, you know, we talk about our vaginas, thinking about the outside part, but no, our vaginas are canal. So the canal is a tube, muscular tube. So you start from here, go inwards, right? Anything that is on the outside that you're seeing is called the vulva, that's V-U-L-V-A. So can we just now say, okay, guys, I've learned one thing today. That's my vulva, not my vagina. Let us not talk about the outer part as vaginas. So we want to go forward and, you know, using the terms appropriately, right? So the vagina is here. It's a canal which leads up to the womb, which is this part here. And of course, our bladder is here, which is, has urethra, which is, you know, lets out the urine. Our pubic bone is there and our tailbone, which is a coccyx, which is our tailbone there. Now you'll notice that these red muscles, there's like a group of muscles, like a hammock. All of that goes long way, like a, as I said, like a hammock, and it does support, and its main purpose is to support our our organs, which are in here, right at that point, right. So this is what the female one looks like. So let's look at the male version. So here we want to look to the the, the picture on the right of the screen and we'll think about the, the male so here of course they don't have a womb they don't have a vagina but here you have the rectum here you have the bladder and as you can see the urethra is longer that comes down to this section here and this is where the prostate is same thing pubic bone tailbone the muscles connect just like that right all right so and this is just another picture that just basically emphasizes what we just spoke about. So now let's think about the role of our pelvic floor muscles. So our the pelvic floor supports our organs, and as I demonstrated, you know, between your rectum, your bladder, your uterus, your vagina, your prostate, it supports the organs as best as possible. And it is very important in terms of your bladder and bowel control. So we don't have people up here, you know, peeing themselves, you know, each time. It has a purpose and it really is imperative that we know the roles of our of the pelvic floor. And it also aids in the passing of urine and feces. So it's supposed to relax enough to let it out. And it also aids in sexual function. So I say sexual function because for male, it, it helps and contributes to the erectile, the functioning. So if it is that the muscles are weak, then it can affect the erectile function. So clearly then they won't be able to have sex. And it also, assists or really helps with orgasms. So that's a part of sexual function. Now, the pelvic floor also has a role in our breathing. So now we have a big diaphragm or muscle, big that which is the diaphragm, which is under our lungs. It is really tied into our pelvic floor. So many patients come to me and I say, why am I here doing breathing exercises when I'm coming here for down there? But the reality is that I, you know, it's tied in and of course it can affect one with the other. And of course it is also important for a necessary in pregnancy and the childbirth. So childbirth is important and we know and a lot of women who have had babies, especially well, whether it is vaginally or even via C-section, your pelvic floor does take a hit. Um, and then that's where we actually have rehabilitation process for these persons, right? So um, this function looks like th different things in different persons. So we have 
you know, what we call stress incontinence. So stress persons may think it's not mental stress. It's more the stress that the, the abdomen, the belly muscles put on the pelvic floor. So that kind of stress comes through whether you cough, you have an increased pressure, if you're sneezing, if you're lifting something, you're running, you're laughing. If you realize that you leak with that part of it, meaning that you're leaking urine or feces, that feces can be leaked also, then, you know, we call that stress incontinence and, you know, it's worked on in a different way. And then you do have the person's food, no matter what, it's like you have to go to the bathroom. It's like, gosh, you can't walk past, sorry, because I'm not just fully Jamaican. You can't walk past the bathroom, um, walk past the bathroom without wanting to pee. So even if you didn't have that urge, you now have the urge, all of a sudden, if, as long as you're nearing your home, you want to pee. If you walk past a water fountain or anything with running water, you want to pee. You just constantly pee in every couple of minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. No, that is not normal, right? So these things are different kinds of incontinence, and that one would be called urge incontinence. And it can have a mix of both, right? Um, so then, of course, dysfunction also looks like when you have pain in the pelvic region. So the pelvic region does, as I said, it's where, you know, as we had showed in the picture, so anyway, you can have pain. If it's your belly bottom, if it is your bottom itself, if it is your lower back, then all of these things tie in and it is a sign of dysfunction. And I had mentioned before, incontinence or fecal incontinence is when we also leak feces, right? Uh, now we have, what is very common is organ prolapse. So prolapse, and it's just, these are big words for some persons, but prolapse just simply mean loss of support. So meaning that you can have your womb coming down, you can have your bladder coming down, you can have your rectum coming down. And, um, and with that said, it does suggest that there is not much support to the pelvic floor muscles and it needs to be there clear to hold these organs up. Right, so this function also includes, especially for persons who are pregnant and even before pregnancy, when you have back pain, um, you see on screen diastasis recti, but it's just simply when your belly muscles start to separate. So some persons may notice that after having a baby, for example, you, you know, it's like you're waiting for that baby push to go down. You realize that, boy, my belly is still big. You can't understand why the belly is still big. Why it seems as if I still have a child inside. Um, so most of the time it's because the muscles are separating. And of course, that's a different target in terms of how to treat it. And of um, sciatica, which is pinch nerve, most commonly known as pinch nerve. So scar tissue concerns for me comes from whether they have done any form of surgery. So it could be that you'd have done like a C-section, for example, or any gynecological surgery or any surgery for that matter, because you and I know that, okay, and I like to share this example. When you get a cut, if you fall today and you scrape your hand and you know where the cut is healing, you notice that your skin is drawing together. It's the same concept. It's our body's response to, to scarring. So once you've gotten a cut, the body starts to lay down tissues in different ways. So doing surgery is still a cut and it is not what the body wanted in the first place. So um, C-section can cause scarring underneath. You, can, you could have been removed fibroids, for example. You could have simply had just any form of surgery. So like persons would have had a hernia removed or any intestinal surgery. All of these things are important because guess what? Outside can be healed so nicely, but then on the inside, it starts to have that drawing up kind of sensation. So we have this, um, and the most important is that because like, a layer of, there's a layer that is underneath that's called a peritoneum that is like a cling wrap material. So think about they cut through muscle, they cut through fascia, they cut through all of these things. And the cling wrap material is literally like that, it's flimsy. And when you think about cutting through that, then you're supposed to stitch up back everything. Then you understand that something will not move or glide as how it should. And so scarring can cause, as I said, dysfunction and later, you'll find that you can have pain with sex, you can have back pain. So some persons who are having back pain, even especially after a C-section, is because something is tied in and there's some form of imbalance at the front that can cause back pain, at, you know, at the back. <laughs> All right, so um, pain with sex is also a form of dysfunction. And there are persons who 
are unable to, for, for example, have any form of penetration. So it's not just about sex either, it's about penetration. So if you have the inability to wear a tampon, like you try to use a tampon and it keeps pushing it back out, it's not going in, that's a dysfunction. If you go to the gynecologist and you're supposed to get an, a, an examination with the speculum, can't manage it, can't tolerate it any at all, that is a form of dysfunction. And of course, having sex for some persons, there are persons out there who are unable to consummate their marriage literally for years. And of course, we can sense the issues, you know, the social issues going forward, um, not being able to have sex because of this and um, pain with sex and even just the inability to have penetration. So that is a form of pelvic floor dysfunction. Also having table pain. So Questions can think about if you're having pain in the bottom ear, especially after sitting down at work for a while. And if you really think about it for some persons, some persons would have fallen on their bottom so many years ago, but never really processed anything because it got up, you were okay. But then guess what? Years later, you start to have issues. So these are all signs of um, pelvic floor dysfunction. So I say sacral iliac joint because this is a joint space between, this is a space here, this is the sacral iliac. So once you start having um, that joint not being mobile as much as possible, then of course it is a form of dysfunction. Uh, having constipation too, you know, for some persons, some persons are constipated and even they go to the doctors, they can't figure out what is going on. They'd have looked on to see um, if everything is functioning, so your intestines are working fine, there is no other medical reason as to why you're having the constipation. A lot of times, it comes down to the fact that the pelvic floor muscles are too tight and then you're literally unable to pass pieces. So we do work on your bowel functioning. So I like to tell patients and encourage them to, you know, because guess what? Even though it might be a gross thing to talk about for some persons, I like persons to know that we want to ensure that we are going to the bathroom as often as possible so that we can have healthy body functions, right? And as I mentioned before, erectile dysfunction is a form of um, pelvic floor disorder and also scrotal pain. So there's literally pain in the scrotum, in the ball sac that persons will see, right? All right, so... Um, there are different risk factors. There are different risk factors um, that can actually, you know, lead to dysfunction in, in, in the long run. So you may just be fine, but then after a certain while, these factors can literally cause issues. So pregnancy can cause it, having a prostate surgery, your age, at a certain point in time, the older you get, naturally your muscles are weakened. Um, genetics. If you've re removed your womb and removing the womb, especially for prolapse, is never the solution because then something else can start to be affected, right? Um, what if you had any form of injury to the pelvic floor? So for some persons, they would have had trauma. So it could have been via motor vehicle accident. You could have had, remember the sacral iliac joint that I showed you, you could have had an accident where you've dislocated that point. So at some point, it can lead to dysfunction. The constipation, as I said before, um, you know, when you start to have intense physical effort, meaning that if your work starts to worsen all of these things, um, exercising excessively can lead to dysfunction. Obesity and, you know, the weight, everything is, is one that plays a role too. So you can, and just a history of back pain. So back pain is considered to be that. And for my years, especially as a physiotherapist, I've realized that there are patients that I would have been treating, that's before, training for pelvic floor, I would be treating these patients for back pain and you can't figure out what the issue is. You can't seem to get rid of the back pain properly. But once I'm recognizing now that once you go from the inside and out, so that's from the pelvic floor, then we do recognize that these patients start to get some relief because it can contribute to your back pain. All right, so uh, let's look at... So let's look at some data. So I like persons to know how severe is this and how common are things, you know. So data, you know, based on the Royal College of, you know, 
obstetricians and gynecologists in the UK, at least over 60% of women have these problems. One of these problems that I've mentioned before. So if you think about it, and I know on the screen is a lot of words now, and um, the research just basically states it. So you'll find that women experience these problems. You'll find that they don't seek help. And it's not just women, by the way. Men also have this function. And as I said before, and a lot of persons don't want to go seek help because it can be embarrassing and they would rather live with the embarrassment than for persons to find out, right? And then when they do find out, then they're not necessarily compliant with their exercises. So this, the, 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 this Royal College had done this survey and this is what it showed that, you know what? Persons don't go to the NHS. You, you probably go to the, or you go to your doctor, your GP, you tell your doctor so many things of what is happening to you, but persons don't talk about it and say, hey, doc, down there isn't working quite well, and you know, I need some help. Um, they don't do that uh, as often as, as the survey shows. But of course, I'm employing persons to just you know, be, be like, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It is your body, and you want to be happy and contented as much as you can be, right? All right, so, um, you know, I was looking for more statistics for the UK aspect, but I guess I had some difficulty. But then guess what? Prostate cancer is prevalent and we are just coming out of September, which was Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. And uh, it's just so you know that 52,000 men per year, that's a lot of persons are affected with prostate cancer, which means that a lot of them have incontinence issues that they can't keep the urine, they have to be wearing pads or cabin in, we call it catheters, or they can't have sex, so whether or not they're diagnosed or before, even after surgery, then you can understand the fact that these men are, are affected also. And then you think about these things that mentally for patients, it doesn't do well for them. It's like you have to be also encouraging them as much as possible so that they can be fine in terms of it's not just a physical work, it's also a mental work for some of these persons, right? All right, so these are just some statistics, you know, generally for America, it's just a lot. It just shows you that 50% of women experience the pelvic organ prolapse, that's a lot. And they, they do surgeries so many, 200,000 surgeries a year. Um, and you know, you one out of three women will suffer during childbirth. And that is a lot, so it means that I have 75 participants here. And if 75 of you were all female, by the way, it just tells me that this point in time, that a third of these persons have some form of prolapse or some issues or um, damage from childbirth. That says a lot, you know, based on how the statistics show and the research shows, right? So let us describe and think about it and how it is that I target patients in terms of how we heal and how we, um, more or less treat accordingly. So there, 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 are kind, there are different kinds of, how I describe it now? So muscles are muscles and muscles can be, can be in different forms. So we have what we call normal tone. So our pelvic floor muscles are supposed to look like a hammock and it's supposed to set in a particular way. But our hammock can be drawn too taut, so it's too tight, too far apart. And as the, the one that's on the left, you can set it is, you know, stretched a little bit too tight. And then you have the one that is more droopy, so it's now a bit lax, so it's too loose, which means that it doesn't support as much. And when you have like that, then you can have no different, different um, issues happening. So it's now overactive versus underactive. And then we're going to go into what is underactive, um, the pelvic hormones and what it looks like. So you may or may not know that you've had it. So let's think about it. So remember we had this course about that you and when you feel cough or you sneeze, that sort of thing, um, that is that's a sign to say that this is not supportive enough. It's not strong enough to keep, um, keep and resist like the pressures that you know, coughing and sneezing actually withstand with, with to the body, right? Um, when you lose control, you can't control you and or your feces, that's something, or even wind, uh, when you're constantly having low back pain, um, the discharging of the tampons, you know, prolapse is one of the main issues. You know, it, it's things you now slipping out of place, you know, and it's, it's, it's that's, that's, that's a bit of, um, that's a bit, that's a bit, we call it now, you know, a bit uncomfortable for patients. 
or a lot because it can be inconvenient too because if you have to be peeing all the time or or you have to be wearing pads diapers constantly you can't go out to start to think to yourself my god i need to drive from london to manchester but i can't afford that ride all the time because guess what no it's too much it's too long and then you start to think and then you can see that okay it's not going to bother do this because it doesn't make any sense it's too embarrassing so your life basically is put on a hold because you're not functioning at this point. And that is that is really a, a deterrent, right? All right, so I like to show persons um, just a few exercises that, you know, it's not, if you're having those kind of issues, you can do a few things, right? So I like to tell persons to do diaphragmatic breathing. So diaphragmatic breathing, because remember I did say that the diaphragm is a big muscle. It controls how... It controls how our, our pelvic floor muscle function. So the diaphragm is under the, 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 the what do you call it? It's under your ribs, right? Under your lungs. And basically, when that moves up, your pelvic floor muscle moves up too. When it goes down, the pelvic floor muscle goes down. So I like to change your breathing, your technique, just from, um, from the breathing alone. It can actually change how your pelvic floor muscle function. So you see on picture, um, this person is laying down flat and you can always try it. Even now, you can put one hand on your chest, one hand on your belly, and you think about your belly as a balloon. Like you're trying to fill your, the, 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 the big part of the balloon is your belly, right? So when you take a big breath in, the belly is supposed to go out and your hand is supposed to move forward. If you're laying down, then it will go as on the picture, right? And when you realize that you have less chest moving out, and more belly, then, you know, that's what we call that matter breathing, right? And of course, when you exhale, means that the belly is supposed to soak back in. So when you have those, that's one of the main reasons and main things that we like persons to practice. And they're simple things. So this is what I, you know, they've had this post. So this is the diaphragm, pelvic floor muscles. You know, you're just trying to breathe. It has like a normal, there's no change. You know, they, they, they want to join these muscles, your belly muscles as much as possible. Um, and we want to also ensure that you know you put in your belly button when you're letting out your, 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 your what do you call it, the air. All right, so we like to start this one off for persons, okay, you know, you can do a bridging. You can literally uh, bend your knees up. You can lift the bottom of the bed. You can do that just so that you can squeeze a ball. And with all of this, we don't ever stop your breath during exercises. Um, and of note, it's a common thing for patients whenever they start having prolapse, doctors will tell us, don't lift anything heavy, um, don't do this, but telling somebody not to do something, um, especially let's say, for example, a young mother just had a baby, has prolapse, there's no way on God's earth that you can tell her not to lift anything. A baby is heavy and the baby is growing, right? So the idea is that I want persons to know how to lift. There's how to live that is most important. So if you're having any of these symptoms, just know that whenever you're lifting, whenever you are, you know, today, for example, the picture here, lifting out the bottom and squeezing the ball, we want persons to exhale. So blow out the air. You realize that the pressure is felt. Pressure that is in the belly part there feels a whole lot different, right? Um, and exercises like these are also useful to actually help. Right. So let's think about the opposite part of it now. Let's think about when your your muscles now are tightening. And you know what? Um, um, a lot of you are Jamaicans or have a Jamaican heritage. And it's 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 not even just about Jamaican. I think it's literally elsewhere because my American counterparts will tell me that it's the culture. The culture will tell women that, trying to be as discreet as possible because this is a church program, but they emphasize and they glorify more or less um, a woman's vagina being very tight. But the, the truth is that if it's tight, it causes problems for the woman. You want strong, and there's a difference between tight and strong. Tight muscles lead to issues. It leads to pain with sex. It leads to the inability to actually have sex. It can lead to you urinating constantly because now you have your ureter, which is like a tube coming down, the muscle is around it and it's just squeezing it constantly. So if something is squeezing, then you can understand you're constantly going to the bathroom, right? Um, 
you can actually sit down and turn it you just sit there for a while and you can't let go the urine is just not coming out so these things are all major factors you have difficulty passing your stools and none of us really need to have that so once you start passing skinny stools or just having difficulty emptying the bladder the, the bowel overall then we know we have a problem right so um the exercises for those persons are different and i don't encourage kegels oh kegels basically for those who don't know is when you tighten the vaginal muscles so that will just be squeezing so a lot of persons are told to when they're sitting down on the toilet to try and stop the urine no, that is a test I must add. It's just a test to see if you can stop your urine, but it should not be anything that is constantly done because that is unhealthy for your bladder. But just that issue. So for males, doing the Kegels is when you basically, for males, for example, they would have their, think about you trying to pass wind and then you're trying to stop that wind from coming out. So you're tightening your anal muscles. That's for males. I don't, we don't really encourage women to do that part of it because it means that you're strengthening the posterior aspect and not your, the front aspect, which is the vaginal muscle, right? So in a sense, though, the same muscle that you'd use to stop the urine is the same muscle that we'd want to tighten. It's just for you to know which muscles are, that, that need to be activated. But in the long run, we do not, and I repeat, do not make it a habit to stop urine while we're urinating, okay? That's not the way to do it because then you change the bladder signals. So um, so again, so that one, that most, that exercise is called Kegels and it's really common, really known. Everything person said, just do some Kegels, but it's not the end all, be all. It doesn't fix everything because guess what? If the persons will have overactive pelvic floor muscles, it will cause further damage and further pain because no, you have already tightened the muscles. Your muscles just don't know how to let go and know you're there kegling away. So you're now squeezing, squeezing, and the muscle just needs, just knows how to squeeze and doesn't know how to relax. And when that happens, that's another set of problems that we do find. All right, so again, the same breathing helps with the, that sort of exercise. Um, we call this the frog pose, you know, that you know, it basically widens. Anything that gets your hip, and your bottom area to really widen, so at deep spots, putting very low exercise like this, um, being in, on the bed like that, in terms of just you know rocking back, you know just trying to get the the bottom area to open up as much as possible. You can even lay down on the bed and basically open up the legs. So that kind of helps to stretch both the hip muscles. It will stretch the muscles around here. If your muscles are tight when you do this exercise. This area that is surrounding your bottom will be crying out, right? All right, so I like to get persons to, to have, you know, a few helpful tips. So one thing, it doesn't matter what kind of dysfunction, if it is that it's overactive or if it is underactive, we need to avoid constipation. And you need to have a high fiber diet, you need to be drinking eight glasses of water daily. So when I say eight glasses of water, there's a common misconception about the glass size. So normally it's a size that is, you know, people think about the tall glass you drink, but when we're talking about like an eight ounce, that's what they would consider a glass of water. So if you have um, a couple of those with fluid intake, water daily, just trying to get, you know, your bowel, your, your, your feces to move through your bowels properly. It does aid it, you know, because guess what? It needs, at some point in time in the intestine, there's a function that once it reaches a part of the intestine, it starts to pull in water. Pull water, pull in, and that's how it helps to flow through. So if there's no water to pull in, then it then it remains and becomes stagnant, okay? And then, of course, it leads to constipation. All right, so going forward to, I want persons to change how they sit in a toilet. Now, you know, we've watched so many movies of Chinese or any person in the Asian country and you see them, their, their, their toilets are more or less is a hole in the ground. And we're thinking, my God, look how much it um, basically let out their feces in the hole. But then guess what? They have the main concept, right? 
No, I know some of us knees can't manage that going down low and clearly we're not going to take out our toilets out of our home. Um, but what we can do is to just use what we call a spotty potty or just a stool. So there's a company that's called spotty potty. So they have their stool that's designed for the bathroom, meaning that you literally can have it and it pushed against, or pushed up against the toilet. So it's a bit discreet. But either way, um, just look at the picture. So when you're sitting down like this on the toilet, upright your your intestines basically more like at a 90 degree angle and in this angle the pelvic floor muscle which is this red thing now starts to kink it starts to pull onto the end part of the rectum now if you have been dysfunction in the sense that you your muscles are really now tight or you know getting um too tight then think about how tight it can be and how much more of a pull it pulls on that rectum and then now you're pushing, sitting down, pushing from that kingdom come to let out that feces through that little section there. And it's just not healthy overall, because guess what? Our, our culture now, and if there's, there's a reason that says that, you know, this side of the world, the Western part of the world, for example, or those who have Western habits tend to have incidences of colorectal cancer more often than other persons, because we have factors that we're not emptying our bowels properly. Now, look what happens when you sit. Like, say you sit, you elevate your foot on a stool, and a stool can be like about seven to eight inches. And it's just dependent on your, the size of your, or the height, rather, of your toilet. So for some persons, and the height of your body stool, right? So for some persons, their toilets can be pretty low. If it's low, and by the time you look, your foot already starts to go up, then you don't need seven to eight inches of a stool. You may need maybe about a one more, two more inch. But if your toilet is tall, then the idea is that your knees need to be like this, right? And you lean forward a little bit. So we're trying to get that 35 degree angle, which you see, there's no kink on the rectum. So that, that means that the muscle that slings around the rectum is now a bit more relaxed and you are able to now defecate freely. So I tell persons, it doesn't matter if you have having any signs of pelvic floor dysfunction, going forward, let us try to have good bowel habits. And this is one way to begin. So let us try to put up our legs on the stool and let us try and do that. And also, and I like persons to try this. I want you to know there's a difference in your body. So we all want to try it. I know things might seem gross. I talk about poop all day, but never mind that. So what I want you to try is pretend as if you're on the toilet right now, right? Pretend as if you're on the toilet and I want you to try and bear down, you know, your mouth closed. You know, like when you're really constipated and you have a I want you to try that. Try that for me. I must try it now, not because I can't see. I need everybody to try, right? So try that. Try to do that bare down. Notice if you feel a pressure between in your belly muscles and the lower part, like right above the vagina or the penis area. You'll feel that pressure in that section, right? And then now I want you to try same sitting down, but instead of doing... Mm, I want you to do, to blow out. So exhale instead. So when you exhale, tell me, feel and see what the muscles feel like. There's a difference in terms of the pressure that is inside the belly area. So this is what I tell persons now. Every form of exertion, anything that requires you to exert too much, so much stress on the body, I want you to actually exhale. So if you're going to lift something, if you're going to get up out of a seat because I don't know if anybody ever tried to get up where you go oh, to stand up. It's a form of exertion and pressure on the in the belly area, right? When you're defecating, we want you to exhale instead of trying to mm, that bear down effect. There's a whole lot of difference. And I want you to practice that. So even tonight or tomorrow, whenever you go to the loop, we want to see, let's see how the body feels, you know, let's see if it made any difference to you, right? Um, then now, of course, I had mentioned this, you don't want to blow out a candle while you're on the toilet. So pretend there's a candle in front of you all the time. Just blow out the candle. And the candle refuse to blow out. So think about it. You just be blowing for the whole time you're defecating. So just practice this technique, right? All right. So that's basically it. Um, you know, so for I like to tell persons that if you or anyone that you know are experiencing oh, oh, symptoms oh, 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 oh. I want you to change pelvic floor therapist. So in England, I've noticed that Milton Keynes University Hospital has a self-referral. 
So I'm not sure if, you're, if it is um, available anywhere else, but I found this resource today. There's a link, I can actually drop it into the um, paper person to see. There's a form that you fill out. So I know usually there's a, there is, like you have to go to your GP, your GP has to refer you, so on, so. But this, the physiotherapy department here allows, there's an incontinence department, and they allow you to self-refer, basically. So the physiotherapist, based on the information on their page, once you fill out the form, they will contact you. So normally the first session or two, I think, at least number one session is, is via the phone because they get to know a little bit more about you and then you start to go in. So it means that, guess what? You have less wait time. You don't have to be trying to go to the GP to go to this, all of these things. And we know the hassle of when the GP ref refuse to refer you onwards and that, has a, that can be a problem. So. Milton Keynes University Hospital has a self-referral program for all of you who are in England. Once you're experiencing any form of dysfunction, both males and females, and, and also children too. I did not really mention it in, my, in my, my presentation because I deal mainly with males and females, but children actually do pediatric and um, pelvic floor physiotherapy. So whether it is that they have a bedwetting problem, even beyond that by a certain age, or they still have constant constipation, they have ones that tell you how to target and ensure for children that they have, you know, good functions going forward, right? So thanks for listening. That's my information. Anybody wants to reach out, that's my phone number, my email. I'm on pretty much, well, three social media um, platforms. And there's also my website. So, you know, you can always message me, reach out. And I want to say thank you for having me and thanks for listening. And if you have any questions now, you can always feel free to message me. All right? Thank you. Thank you. I'll say thank you after, but I'll ask the comms team to come in now and take the, do the question and answer. Okay, thank you so much, Stan. Okay, God bless you. All right, so I'm gonna give you the two questions that we had come in. And I will also give a moment if anyone would like to unmute and ask a question, you can do so. All right. Um, so the first question, Anna Kay, how long does it take to relieve urinary incontinence in men after prostate cancer surgery? If this is not resolved, what are the next steps moving forward? So I'll read it again. How long does it take to relieve urinary incontinence in men after prostate cancer surgery? If this is not resolved, what are the next steps moving forward? Okay, so unfortunately that, that question in that particular case does not have a set time because it's dependent on the surgery. So based on how, um, Depends on the extent. So if the, say you have your prostate and of course, I don't know if you remember how I shown on the screen that, you know, the bladder was at the top, the ureter ran through the prostate basically before it went out through the venous. Depends on the extent of the damage, then it may be that more parts of the, 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 the there's a sphincter, there's a particular sphincter that controls muscle. So there's a, there's an involuntary sphincter and there's a voluntary one. So that's the best way to put it. So if it is that with the doctor and based on the surgeon, if they had to go out and take a lot and if they take the one that has the, the involuntary, mean that no matter what we needed the involuntary, that was the body's way to respond. If that was removed, then it means that at that point in time, your, your incontinence issues can be decreased, but not cured. But then for some persons, then it may not be that extensive and then you can actually have some a lot of improvements but generally i find that it does take up to two years really two years um with incontinence for males to post um prostate this prostate surgery um they will then um two years <laughs> it can take up to two years but again as i said before there are persons it does want to be a permanent thing. It can have the symptoms being reduced, but may not be cured. And at that point in time, it just means that you just have to arm yourself with the necessary things. Whether or not it is clamping, um, there is some little little condoms like you can slip on, or some things that they wear like a like a sling that kind of 
you know, catches the urine as much as possible. They still need to do strengthening exercises, but it just may not improve a hundred percent. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and is there anything you can recommend for going forward? Um, what are the next steps? Anything that they should be doing? I mean, definitely after prostate surgery, most definitely you should be doing physiotherapy. As a matter of fact, we actually encourage persons to do to do um, physiotherapy before doing the surgery. If it is that um, afterwards you just keep, you have to constantly be doing your exercises, and there are certain exercises that you know, you know, you treat, you go to your physiotherapist, they would have given you what you need to do, strengthening, whatever it is. Even if you're discharged, you still need to actually keep up with that. But as I said before, um, there are different tools that are available to actually be discreet. So they don't have to wear like a whole diaper, more or less. They have things that it's not as obvious for some bulky. So there are different things and in different countries. And of course, England would have more resources than what Jamaica has. So they even have more than what we have here when it comes to that kind of, um, you know, just for catchment purposes. But as I said, unfortunately, not everybody after prostate surgery gets rid of, and it's not even just incontinence, there's also erectile dysfunction. And that one is usually the last one to come back to, I must say. Incontinence can get better faster, but the, the erection, that's a whole other ball game. It does take some time. Thank you so much, wonderful. And you've got lots of comments rolling in here saying it's a very yeah. informative presentation and thank you so much. All right, so next question for you. Is acupuncture a helpful therapy in pelvic floor management? Is acupuncture a helpful therapy in pelvic floor management? Um, I'm gonna be honest. I, I don't know much about acupuncture, but I do know about dry needling. I don't know, needles, same thing. <laughs> I really, I don't want to say it's the same thing because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, be little basically an acupuncturist job. But I know from a physical type of perspective that when we do dry needling, it's very effective. So I'm gonna assume that acupuncture does have a lot to do with that and can help patients. But I do know about dry needling. It's, it's the needles look the same as the acupuncture's needle, but our techniques are a little bit different. Thank you so much. All right, next question. Are there any exercises that you should be doing daily for both male and females um, for pelvic floor health? Are there any exercises that you should be doing daily um, for male and female health in the pelvic floor? Um, yes and no. <laughs> so remember we had gone through, so my thing is that before anybody starts to do exercises, it's like you'd want to identify issues that if you're having any issue, because guess what? It's always, over the years, it has always been a quick fix of persons to recommend the kegels, just tighten, tighten, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. But as I said before in the presentation, it is not for everybody, because if you're having your pelvic floor muscles being overactive, then you'll find then that you're putting yourself in danger more so. So yes, I encourage persons to do exercises, but then it just comes down to what you're experiencing. And if these are, you're unsure of any single thing, if you're unsure of any single thing, you can actually consult with a professional and then they can even have that baseline assessment to see, all right, is it, is it that it is underactive or is it overactive? But I do tell persons though, there's a direct link between your hip mobility and your pelvic floor muscles. Because if your hip muscles are tight, it, you're gonna have issues. So for example, trying to do a deep squat, you know, that's hard to do. I don't know about anybody else, but it is hard on my end. If you're trying to do that, then you know, it means that you can start having issues later on. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, next question. Do I have a problem if I mainly run to the loo at night rather than the day? Do I have a problem if I mainly run to the loo at night rather than the day? Yes. So some persons, they have nighttime um, urination, frequent urination. So guess what? You're supposed to only go zero times for the night or one the most. If you find yourself going to the bathroom more than that during the night, then we have a problem. 
So, of course, for everybody, there's not a one size fits all thing with anybody. I'd have to assess to see if it is that you're having weakness or anything, which most times in that one can lead to weakness. Or, or but then guess what? A, a common rule I like to tell persons is that let us start with reducing your fluid intake before bed. So, um, if you go to bed nine o'clock, I tell persons, I tell my patients, the first thing you're going to work on is to cut out water drinking, tea drinking, all of those things um, two hours before, by the way, two hours before. And oh, as I mentioned tea, I should mention tea because UK loves tea and tea has caffeine in it. And just so you know that caffeine is a bladder irritant, right? So even if you didn't have any issues before, constantly drinking tea, soda, spicy food, all of those things are bladder irritants, by the way. I didn't mention that. That's a good thing it popped in. So we're reducing those things. So we're being mindful. So let's say, for example, all right, let's start with the fluid intake. So we go to bed at 9 o'clock and say, take your medications, do anything you want to do from 7 o'clock. Don't do this big gulping and drinking after that. If you feel thirsty right before bed, I like to say one sip just to wet the throat, then you go to sleep. Then you know, we want to reduce our caffeine intake because if you're trying to go to bed now with your tea, a cup of tea, because that's a nice thing in the warm session. So think about if it's irritating the bladder. You want to reduce your caffeine intake, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Wonderful. All right. You're stirring the people, Anna Kay, because the questions are rolling in. All right. So um, next question. In Jamaica, people say body calm down. Is this the same as prolapse that you mentioned earlier? So in Jamaica, body calm down, is this the same as the prolapse that you mentioned earlier? Yes. Yes, and I learned that recently because, you know, like, you know, you hear, it's, and it's not a common um, saying nowadays. It's mostly used, especially when I was growing up. So the older persons would say, body come down. But really and truly, that's what it is. Your body really, because, you know, person will tell us, may I, may I lift that up because you're going to have body come down. So that excess lifting can cause the prolapse, all of those things. So, yes, it, that's what it is. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Next yeah. question. For vaginal prolapse, can pelvic floor exercises cure this problem or will you eventually eventually need surgery? So for vaginal prolapse, can pelvic floor exercises cure this problem or will you eventually need surgery? Surgery is dependent on the grade. So there are different grades. So it's from grades one, two to four. So one is that, you know, there's, you can see it just like that. Maybe the doctors can look at it based on whether it's a scan or anything. They can notice that this has shifted down a little bit. Um, two comes a little bit further down. Three is to the opening. So right as you look at the opening, it's right above it. And four means that it is through it. Right. For all of those patients, they need to be doing pelvic floor physiotherapy constantly. However, I like to tell persons that stage three and four, stages three and four, Surgery can be a good thing to help you. Surgery meaning that once it's an attachment. Now, doctors like to think that taking out the womb is, a, is, 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 is what do you call it, the solution, but it is not a solution um, because then the bladder can start coming down, your rectum can start coming down through your vagina. All of those things can happen, right? Um, either way, it shows that you just need to be strengthening your pelvic floor muscles, but um, just to repeat that stages one and two sure can be fixed by straight physiotherapy. Stage three, I can get my stage three patients up to one at stage one. Um, they, some of them don't want to do physio, um, what we call it surgery. So I can, they're comfortable with their stage one and they may wear what we call a pessary, which is like a support you insert in, or they um, might just be trend with their exercises. Once it's born, it is out there, really and truly it needs to be attached and you continue your pelvic floor physiotherapy. Thank you so much. Um, just another question leading on from that. Um, is vaginal prolapse very painful or prolapse of any kind? Is it a painful condition? Would you know you have it because of the pain? So, um, <laughs> 
it's funny. It's funny because even just yesterday or since week, I had a patient. Not done, but last week, I mean, I had a patient. No pain, but then guess what? You've noticed a bulge. And I must say, ladies, gentlemen, everybody, let us examine and look at our bodies. Take a mirror, look down there, and note your anatomy. You need to know what it looks like. You need to notice the color and the and it's thing because even the vulva region can start to have cancer. It's not to frighten anybody. We need to look on certain changes, right? Um, but for most persons, they notice there's a bulge coming through. Right. So it doesn't it doesn't have to be painful, but it can have a bulge. But either way, a standard thing is that once you start to have like a pressure in the pelvic region, so your belly button feel like it feel heavy, you can't really understand why it feel heavy. It can be painful, but not a lot of persons have pain. You can feel like something dragging, like you can't describe it, but it's feel like something coming down. So that heaviness, that dragging feeling, um, the bulge is there, there's just a discomfort. Those are all signs of a prolapse. Pain can be for some persons, but best believe that you may not have pain. Majority of persons don't have pain. It's just usually that dragging feeling, the heaviness, um, that discomfort in that area. Okay, thanks for that. Um, leading on from that again, um, with vaginal prolapse, does it have a big impact on your sex life? Will vaginal prolapse have a big impact on your sex life? I, I want to say it's a, it would be a big impact. You can have sex while having a prolapse, right? However, it just comes down to you, the person. So for some persons, <laughs> and then to the, the, right, the big problem can come in is that there are women who are just so conscious of what is happening with them that then that that self-consciousness becomes a deterrent. So either way you take it, you just can't have sex. So then that impacts your sex life negatively. That's one. Um, two, if it is that you, you start to have, it may be uncomfortable for some persons, but for some persons, they will tell you that they have sex and it's not painful. They don't feel anything. They're quite fine. And, um, but if, it depends, I guess, to the extent of it. It may feel like it, it is kind of pushing up against something, but we still, persons can still have sex, but it just depends on the extent of it and an individual feeling, I guess. Thank you so much. Um, the next question. We are seeing lots of adverts aimed at men promoting tablets for the use of erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Is exercise a better route than the pharmaceuticals? So we're seeing a lot of adverts aimed at men for erectile dysfunction. Is exercise a better route than the pharmaceuticals? It depends on what the cause of the erectile dysfunction is. So yes, I do mention that a lot of times it can be from the muscles um, functioning poorly, but the reality is that some erectile dysfunction has other issues, so it just needs medical assistance. But um, that's the first thing. We want to figure out the cause of the dysfunction so it doesn't apply to everybody else. Um, but then if you've had if you've had, like say for example, post prostate surgery, you know, the pills will help you and it does go a long way to help. And you, at that point in time, you probably want to mix both exercises and the pills. So again, it just depends on each person, depends on the root cause, number one. But if it is strictly, if we've noticed that and based on an assessment that it is from your pelvic floor muscles, then clearly, Strengthening the pelvic floor muscles will be the ideal way to go because if you don't strengthen it, then you're just always going to be on the pills. You don't just don't get better, right? Thank you so much. Uh, next question. I think these are the last two now. I can't get my husband to go to the doctor for erectile dysfunction. Any advice? I can't get my <laughs> husband to go to the doctor for erectile dysfunction. Any uh, advice? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, it's tough because it's it's it no gone it has no gone into a psychological aspect of it, and unfortunately, unfortunately, a spouse is that the worst person to get anybody to go to the doctor. 
<laughs> you know, um, it, that, that, I, I just don't know how to put it, but reality is that nobody really wants to listen. And it can be, it's embarrassing for men that feel as if they're losing their sense of worth, their, their manhood, every single thing. And it's embarrassing. They don't want anybody to know about it. But I like persons to know the flip side of things. Sure. If it is that if they come to some form of compromise, maybe do secretly encouraging them to go and if they don't have to tell the wife about it, because maybe they just feel embarrassed about looking about it. Um, they can think about the potential, I mean, weighing the pros and the cons, letting them know that, okay, um, if you don't go, then you mean that you're going to always have this function. And if you feel like you want to come back up, then maybe it needs to you know, be attended to. But overall, something like that, when you say that, that requires psychological support. It's where a professional counselor will come in <laughs> because it now is going to take a lot. But usually, I don't know, I find that when I speak, and that's the thing too. So I will say, I was going to say that I find that when I talk to the males, they will listen, but then the issue is to actually get them to go and talk to somebody. So maybe just as just as um okay so for example try milton Keynes. they have a they have a self-referral program they do a conversation over the phone maybe if somebody talks you'd be surprised that that can actually help somebody just from doing a phone conversation instead of going to the doctor so there are different ways but that's a tricky one and that that's really i don't even know if that's in my area but that's a tricky one fortunately i don't know if i can help with that <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Um, actually, um, yeah, just two more. Is there any going back as you age regarding incontinence issues? Is there any going back as you age regarding incontinence issues? I think that we're trying to say is it an inevitable part, inevitable part of aging, incontinence? Um. Well, can I interpret that both ways, two ways? Maybe it could be that, and it could be that if they've had incontinence as they're older, maybe they can have any cure. I don't know. I think I've interpreted it that way too. All right, so let me look at it either way. Yes, age is a, is a factor for incontinence, for you to develop incontinence, um, because naturally, I think it's culturally that person's just not necessarily being not necessarily exercising and not necessarily keeping fit, and especially as you age, you'd have just not it have reduced your, your exercises, right? Um, and just generally speaking, you'll have different muscles in the body just getting weaker than others. Uh, so that's why age becomes a factor. Um, but then I would love, to, I would like to say, and as pelvic floor therapists, we always say, it doesn't matter what age you are, doesn't matter what stage you are, leaking urine may be common, but it is not normal. So it doesn't matter does not matter at all the age doesn't matter the the length of time it can be fixed as long as you find out the root cause and then work on it it can be fixed that's great thank you um another one just come in so bear with me okay, is there anything that can be done with regard to diet for pelvic floor health is there anything that can be done with regard to diet pelvic floor health um pelvic floor health can be can be white sorry sorry so remember we had mentioned um bladder let's think about bladder function so there are bladder irritants so if it is that you love coffee tea caffeine is a lot of caffeine so it's pepsi it's all of those things and if your intake is a lot then you can trigger the bladder to be to be letting out more frequently so spicy food uh we call it spicy food, the alcohol, um, caffeine, all of those things. So if it is that when it comes to your diet, then you'd want to adjust accordingly. I'm never ever so many tell persons to cut out anything because it's like telling persons to cut out a coffee. It's like, I know I'm not going to get them to comply, <laughs> but I do tell you to reduce um, as much as possible. Pelvic health taking it a step further because, of course, I also deal with um, fertility issues, women with fertility, you know, recent training with that too. And you recognize that once your diet then promotes anything that's inflammatory, then it becomes more difficult to reduce 
inflammation within the pelvic space, which then starts to affect how your body function. So my nutritionist would tell me and my doctor and even me training will say, for example, the Mediterranean diet, which you know you can read up for more about it because I'm not the expert for that part. So I'm learning myself, but it really targets um non-inflammatory that's the diet so i know inflammation once it's once you start producing inflammation then you start to trigger things in the in the in the pelvic space more than usual right and which can cause the pain especially for persons with endometriosis that kind of condition right thank you so much all right um one other question, just bear with me. I think this is more a comment that's come in and then I'm gonna give a couple of minutes for anyone if you want to unmute and ask a question. So okay. just bear with me. Um, this is more a comment. The medical field have said they have now found new treatment for those men who suffer with prostate cancer, which is less invasive and a lesser time for wait time for treatment. Um, yeah, I think that was what the, the response was when we talked okay. about the cancer earlier. All right, thank you for that. Um, so if anyone has a question you'd like to ask Sister Anna Kay, you can unmute and ask it now. If you haven't put it in the chat, if you wish to do so. Um, please be aware that this is recorded, but this section may be edited out if you share anything that is personal or private. God bless you, you can ask. Well, I'll give one, all right, five seconds more for a countdown. Well, what I think that means, Anna Kay, is that you've done such a thorough job with your presentation and your questions that we are all left now speechless. God bless you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our saints and friends viewing from all over the world, Jamaica, Canada, America, Florida, wherever you are viewing from. Thank you so very much. Okay, so I'm going to hand back to our lovely moderator for the evening, Sister Lucy. Thanks for having Thank me. You. Have a good evening. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anake. This is Anake. Don't, Thank don't you ahead. for taking the time out to come and um, spend the time with us to no enlighten us, educate us um, in identifying conditions that's linked to our pelvic floor weakness <laughs> and also. Um, the exercises that we can use to support that and also the helpful tips or diet mm -hmm. and everything else sitting even position. on the toilet even on mm -hmm. the toilet so mm -hmm. thank you so much thank you so so much we really appreciate it, it was a wonderful presentation you're not too old to learn <laughs> and um thank you very much and also again thanks for all the visitors from um canada usa and jamaica online with us tonight Thank you so much. At this time, I'll hand back over to the comms team to make an um, some announcement. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Sister Lisita. God bless you. And thank you again, Sister Anake, for a beautiful, well-taught and thorough presentation. Truly learned a lot. God bless you. So just very quickly, before you all log off, don't log off just yet. Just bear with us. Um, if you would like to give to the House of Beulah, thank you in advance for those of you who will do so you can simply log on to paypal so if you log on to www.paypal.me forward slash b-a-c-u-k if you do find it in your heart to give praise god please do use the reference h f m so that's just health on mondays or Yes, so help family month rather, or Mondays, whatever. So just use that reference HFM and then you can donate and you can give to the House of Beulah. So that's www.paypal.me forward slash BAC UK. And we will thank you in advance for those of you who will bless the House of Beulah. Now the Wilsden branch will continue in this month of October with their family month. They had a, a wonderful session yesterday, I believe, Women's Sunday. So next week, Sunday, the 8th of October, the youth will be in charge, praise God. And the theme is 
the power of unconditional love and that's taken from the book of genesis chapter 45 verse 1 to 28 so those of you that are in the wilston area on sunday next week please do pop down to 130 church road and you can support the saints there for their family month on the 8th of october and do remember that it carries on right the way through to the end of the month also now we've had our lovely sister Anike, who's given a fantastic presentation as you've just heard so we continue with health and family monday so next week monday which is the 9th of october we'll have miss melanie williams right here on the national zoom platform same time 7 p.m she'll be doing a presentation and a talk on the subject of autism so please do tell your friends you were all blessed this evening there was at most 80 people or 80 devices online tonight. So we had a really good turnout. So please do log back on again next week and support our speaker, Miss Melanie Williams, who will be giving a presentation on autism. God bless you. And at this time, I'm just going to hand over, I believe now to um, Pastor Dunkley, who will be just giving a few words in Jesus name. Over to you, Overseer Dunkley, God bless you. God bless you, everyone. Praise the Lord. Grateful to God for this time, this opportunity. I sat here tonight, praise the Lord, and uh, just glued to the screen. Uh, just First of all, I just want to greet uh, the women department. I want to greet our sister Lowe and all those on the core team who has put this on and, um, you know, the lot of hard work that has gone into this. And a special, special thanks tonight for um, sister, uh, sister Anna Kay. I can't believe it's her that I'm listening to sitting here. Praise the Lord, uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, you know, uh, words would fail me because I didn't know she had all of this in her. <laughs> Praise the Lord, but I uh, thank God for her tonight. And and I just want to greet, uh, you know, all the pastors who are on, you know, everyone who's on tonight. Do you, know, do you know, I sit here and I was thinking that many, many years ago, we didn't have, we didn't have this, <laughs> you know, um, uh, we were, and we were poorer for it. But I thank God, you know, that the Lord has blessed us, you know, the body of Christ, that we have persons, as she would say, like um, Sister Anike tonight, who has, uh, you know, just really gave us an excellent presentation, being so informative. Believe me, I sit here and, you know, things that I was so ignorant about, she has set, shed so much light in it. And I'm hoping it's the same for many of you tonight, you know. So I really do give God thanks for, for Sister Anike. I'm sure her... Her mother is so proud, you know, <laughs> sitting up there in Wembley and also, uh, you know, Minister Juna Lowe's, you know, there in uh, Luton, uh, you know, so I really do give God thanks. Thank God, you know, for what he's now doing in the body of Christ. You know, th there's a change of foot, you know, there's a change taking place, you know, where God is not only dealing with, <clears throat> with our spirit, as it were, but he's also dealing with the physical man. And and even the way that um, Sister Anike spoke about, um, you know, uh, the toilet thing. <laughs> And I uh, was asking for a demonstration. I was asking Sister Pat to demonstrate for me, you know, I was sitting here because I couldn't move. But, but anyhow, you know, we were just having a laugh, you know, sitting here. But, but thank you so much, Sister Andy Kay. God bless you. God bless you all tonight in Jesus' name. I want to say thank you, Pastor. Yes. Um, Thanks for everyone coming on tonight again. A big, big thank you. Continue to support our women's department. Um, our next session is next week, and you know church is Sunday. Uh, this time we'll have our closing prayer, and we'll ask Minister Erica to do our closing prayer and the benediction. Hallelujah. Let's all bow our heads. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you one more time to give thanks. We thank you, Almighty God, for this session. Uh, God, it's so great to learn about our bodies and to learn how we can better look after ourselves. I thank you for the pre presenter tonight, and I thank you, Lord, for each and every one who came out, came on and have listened. I thank you for the comments, the questions, the enthusiasm, and I pray that we not only just get excited because of what we've heard tonight, but we we'll put it into practice. Hallelujah so that we can be healthy, wealthy, and wise spiritually also. I pray as we go from here, we continue to focus on you, the giver of life. 
and learn, hallelujah, how to be better by looking after our bodies. Take all the glory, God, and we thank you. Thank you for our pastors and all who have come on to support. Thank you for this women's department. I pray we'll continue to go from strength to strength. Take all the glory now. We separate the one from the other as we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our mm. Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Let all the people say, Amen. God bless amen. you. Amen.